Did you know that Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise in history? It's made more money than any Marvel creation, or even Star Wars. After decades of recession and geopolitical decline, Japan's economy is tapping into the power of anime. The industry is already a $30 billion cash cow, and that's expected to more than double over the next 10 years. The fandom draws a lot of visitors to the country. Some 33 million tourists are expected to visit this year, seven times the number of two decades ago. In fact, I would say the tourism might be Japan's greatest economic success story of the past 30 years. When people visit, they pick up trends and spread the culture, which encourages more people to visit and hopefully more investment. Just look at New York. Young people there are obsessed with Muji pens, visiting manga stores and eating onigiri for lunch. This kind of soft power is helping Japan emerge from a long period of economic underperformance, known as Ushinawarita Junen in Japanese, or the lost decade. But the first decade, from the early 90s, turned into a second and then a third. Wages stagnated, unemployment rose, and deflation set in. Even the likes of Nintendo temporarily lost their footing. And the problems weren't just financial. The period left deep psychological scars on the Japanese people. When I moved here in 2003, Japan was right in the middle of the lost decades. The malaise wasn't immediately clear to me. Like much of my generation around the world, I'd been exposed to Japanese culture since my childhood in Ireland. The country seemed sophisticated, technologically advanced, and far enough away from home. But the longer I stayed, the more apparent the economic malaise became. Fast fashion brands appealing to the price conscious, like Uniqlo, were popping up everywhere. And the media were worried about NEETS, that stands for Not in Education, Employment, or Training. But in recent years, Japan has emerged from this funk. The job ice age is over. Companies are starting to pay higher wages. The suicide rate is lower than in the US and homelessness has fallen by an incredible 90%. Earlier this year, the Nikkei stock index also hit a new record high, breaking a previous record from 1989. I'm not arguing that Japan is headed for a new golden age, but it is regaining its place on the global stage. Now, it just needs to decide how it's going to take back the spotlight. This is the story of how that happened. The early 90s in Japan were still considered peak bubble years. Real estate and stock prices had been overvalued, buoyed by speculation, easy credit, and loose central bank policies. But as the West set off on a post-Cold War boom, the bubble began to burst. Economic decline was undeniable. As workers prioritized stability over pay increases, wages flatlined. People began hoarding cash, which further drove deflation. To make matters worse, in 1995, a devastating earthquake hit the city of Kobe, and the Tokyo subway system was attacked by a cult using sarin gas. By the end of the decade, Japan was falling from a close second behind the US in global trade to dramatically behind China. In 1999, Japan became the first country in the world to lower its interest rate to zero. When I landed in 2003, the country appeared to be turning a corner. Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi had taken charge. His quest for reform was just as popular as his Richard Gere-like mane of hair. But the excitement wouldn't last. He left office in 2006 with his reform agenda only half completed. By 2008, the global financial crisis had struck and the economy fell even further into recession. Japan's woes were beyond the control of any one person. But when Shinzo Abe became prime minister in 2012, his signature Abenomics economic reform program sought to stimulate the economy through government spending and central bank bond buying. Abenomics helped especially his introduction of the country's first corporate governance code, which sought to introduce more transparency to corporate boardrooms. Companies started treating shareholders better. These days, they sell off unproductive units or even delist if they can't boost corporate value. But Abe resigned in 2020, inhaling health because of the pandemic, and he would be assassinated in 2022. But Abenomics did attract one famously astute overseas investor, Warren Buffett. A few months into the global pandemic, he declared he was bullish on Japan. Japan was one of the few developed nations that managed to contain the pandemic without resorting to lockdowns or having a sky-high mortality rate. And when the world's borders finally opened back up, both travelers and investors liked what they saw in Japan. By the time the Nikkei broke its record this February, the value of the Japanese shares owned by Berkshire Hathaway, Buffett's company, had increased by $19 billion. Their results have exceeded our expectations since we purchased the group. I think, I think their dividends on average have gone up 70% or something like that. The signals were obvious. Japan was a buy. 
Today, Japan's employment ice age is over and wages are on the rise. Women, in particular, have been mobilized in the workforce. Younger Japanese people are taking more career risks. They're more willing to consider joining or founding startups instead of taking the traditional career paths of becoming bankers or civil servants. The population might be aging rapidly, but today the country's birth rate looks positively healthy compared to neighbors such as China or South Korea. Japan is also becoming more open to foreign workers, which is also helping the economy. When I moved to Tokyo from Osaka in 2011, it was unusual to see foreigners working in restaurants or convenience stores. Now it's more unusual to encounter a Japanese staffer at the 7-Eleven. Foreign money is also flowing in, especially from China, fleeing President Xi Jinping's increasingly oppressive grasp. US policy has also shifted away from China and toward Japan, first under Donald Trump and now even more so under Joe Biden. Tokyo realizes it needs to take its place as a regional leader, especially in the face of increasing Chinese aggression. Rahm Emanuel, the US ambassador to Tokyo, has become Japan's biggest cheerleader. It's a new Japan, he told me, and all of us have to update our assumptions, our analysis, and our expectations. Hey, if Pokemon can learn how to evolve, Pikachu. maybe the world can too.